What's the deal here? This place is filthy. You're obviously using your illness as an excuse to slack off on housework. You know how much I like things clean. Normally, you should come home even from the hospital to clean and greet your husband. The man I call my husband is likely not human. He must be a devil or something. Otherwise, how could he say such absurd things to his wife who is in the hospital for cancer? But what this clueless man doesn't know is that he is about to hear. I'm sorry, but your wife just passed away. These words are merely the prologue to the hell that awaits him, a message from the doctor. My name is Bella, a 32-year-old office worker. I've been married to my husband Ronald for almost two years, introduced by a mutual friend. I wish I could say we have a smooth marital life, but that's far from true. Work is fulfilling, and I'm genuinely happy when my efforts are recognized. The job is going well, but the issue lies within the household. When I come home tired from work, Ronald, who gets home before me, is the one to greet me. As I change into loungewear, I ask, Is a ready-made dinner okay? Ronald sighs. You're cutting corners just because you work. Look at this. He shows me a photo of a lavish dinner spread. By the way, he's shown it to me countless times before. This all began when Ronald attended his high school reunion about a year ago. He changed little by little after coming back, influenced by something. He showed me pictures of trendy rooms, saying, I want to unify the furniture color and make the room look like this. Apparently, he went to a friend's lavish high-rise apartment after the reunion and started envying his friend's lifeless, chic room. However, that friend is a young and successful businessman. We don't make enough to maintain a lifestyle on par with his. Next, he suggests moving to an apartment that would cost three times our current rent. So, how are we going to pay for that? Ronald replies to my incredulous face. You're good at budgeting, Bella. We're both working, so we'll figure it out, right? I finally lost it with my husband, who just chuckled dismissively. Listen, enough is enough. I don't know if you're aiming for a luxurious lifestyle or what, but have you ever heard of living within your means? You talk about managing the household budget, but what about the money for the beer you're drinking right now? From now on, pay for it from your own pocket money. I glared at him sternly. He seemed frightened and said, Wow, calm down. I was just making a light comment. It's a buzzkill when you can't even take a joke. He muttered under his breath, but I knew he was absolutely serious. Our fights increased, and I started experiencing stomach pain more frequently. At first, I thought it was just stress, but then something alarming happened to my body, unexplained bleeding that wouldn't stop. I went to a nearby hospital and was diagnosed with uterine cancer. I shivered involuntarily even though it wasn't cold. The doctor then asked me, Do you plan on having children in the future? I was in such a bad condition that preserving my uterus was unlikely, removal was the best option. I'll discuss it with my husband. I couldn't stop the tears as I drove home. Losing my uterus meant I could never have children again. How will Ronald react? He loves kids, what if he leaves me? When I got home, my husband and I had a long, heartfelt discussion about the diagnosis, treatment, and how he felt about it all. He was deeply shocked, but we made a decision. I took a leave of absence from work and began my treatment. Ultimately, we chose to proceed with a hysterectomy followed by chemotherapy. On the day of the surgery, my husband took time off work to accompany me to the hospital. Even though I wouldn't be home for a while, he seemed oddly cheerful, which struck me as strange. After enduring an eight-hour major surgery, I lost my uterus. The doctor explained that I was at the lowest stage of the disease. During my hospital stay, 
co-workers and friends came to visit. When a friend with a child came, my heart ached with guilt. Walt and Amelia, my father-in-law and mother-in-law who live nearby, also visited. Amelia followed her words of sympathy with, We understand it's hard for you, Bella, but going forward, please manage the household and finance as well. Walt immediately intervened. Not now, Amelia. Bella, don't worry about it. I didn't understand their intentions at the time. As for my husband Ronald, every time he came to visit, he was oddly upbeat. You're going to be surprised when you get out, Bella. Just look forward to it. I had thought there might be a surprise waiting for me based on what my husband said. But honestly, I was just happy that he visited me in the hospital. After a while, I got a temporary discharge from the hospital. I was thrilled to return home after so long, but I realized I would have to be readmitted soon for chemotherapy. My husband picked me up and said, Don't be shocked when you see the house, okay? A feeling of unease washed over me. What? What is this? The moment I walked in, I was stunned. Our home had undergone a complete transformation. What used to be a light, airy space with white tones was now dark and chic, filled with black furniture. My favorite sofa, table, and even the rug were gone. In their place were pieces that catered entirely to my husband's taste. Even the appliances were new and black, as if coordinated to match everything else. When I froze in shock, my husband gleefully said, Cool, right? I did this all by myself. Oh, we can change the wallpaper back when we leave, so that'll be an extra expense. I felt like collapsing. I suddenly remembered something and rushed to the bedroom. I rushed to our bedroom, only to find it completely altered too. Where is my dresser? Caught off guard, my husband stumbled for words. Uh, sorry, I got carried away and, uh, threw it away. I exploded in anger. Threw it away? Are you kidding me? I've told you how important that dresser is to me, Ronald. Bring it back right now. Every shout intensified the pain from my surgeries. Ronald paused before blurting out. Well, what's thrown away is thrown away. Deal with it. So annoying. Then he stormed out. Alone in this unfamiliar space, I sank to the floor. I couldn't hold back the tears. That dresser was a cherished gift from my mom when I first moved out for my job. My parents divorced when I was in elementary school, and I'd lived with my mom ever since. She passed away in a car accident not long after I got married. That dresser was irreplaceable to me. And I had told Ronald many times whether he understood or simply forgot. The fact remained that I had lost something dear to me. Between my hospital stays, life became a living nightmare. I had been looking forward to coming home, but my husband continued to be in a bad mood. He barely spoke to me, and when he did, he'd say, You're home all day, at least do some housework. Look at this dust. Are you really okay with this? It's embarrassing for a woman. I can't, I'm in a recovery phase and need to rest. I responded. How about you do some things for yourself for once? You only clean what's visible, Ronald. You could at least clean the drain or the toilet sometimes. From the next day, my husband started to be passive aggressive. He would deliberately avoid washing my clothes, and when he bought food, he'd eat it in front of me, flaunting it. Tired of his childish behavior, I relied on friends for groceries. On the day of my readmission, my husband didn't accompany me. I went to the hospital alone. The chemotherapy was more grueling than I had imagined. The nausea was one thing but seeing my carefully maintained hair fall out was deeply unsettling. And my husband? Shortly after my admission, he left for an extended business trip. 
I thought he might call to check on me, but he never did. One day, my mobile phone started ringing repeatedly. By this point, I had no energy to talk to my husband. Just as I was hesitating to pick up, he called the hospital. Switching the call to speaker, I heard him yell. What the hell is this? The house is a mess. You're obviously just using your illness as an excuse to avoid housework. I like a clean house. You should be welcoming me home by cleaning. Even the nurse who handed me the phone looked distressed. To my surprise, it wasn't me who responded to my husband's ridiculous words. Unfortunately, your wife has just... What? She just finished her discharge briefing and is about to handle some paperwork. Could you please not disrupt her with your nonsense? My husband's flustered voice came through the phone. If you'd been listening, who do you think you are? You could just clean yourself. I've been a doctor for many years, and I've never met someone as unreasonable as you. You're annoying. The attending doctor promptly hung up. The doctor quickly composed himself. I apologize for my outburst. I have a daughter, and I got emotional. Don't worry about it. Thank you, doctor. I plan on divorcing him anyway, so it's no big deal. Upon hearing my response, the doctor smiled, clearly relieved. Well, that's good to hear. After getting discharged from the hospital, I headed straight to a particular place. Not long after, my husband Ronald burst into the room, his face flushed. Bella, why are you here? Seeing me, he didn't offer a word of concern, he just stood there frozen. It's Bella's discharge day, so we came to pick her up. Now sit down, Ronald. Amelia, sitting beside me, said coldly. It looked like Ronald was hiding something, he blinked rapidly, visibly shaken. Don't you think you owe Bella and us an apology? Amelia said, but Ronald remained silent. Ronald! You asked us for financial help, claiming that Bella was overspending. Isn't that all a lie? Walt's furious voice echoed throughout the room. Ronald had been lying and it was a pretty nasty lie at that. During my second hospital stay, Walt and Amelia had told me something. Bella, we know it's not the best time, but we're not exactly flush with cash either. We hope this will be the last time we have to lend you money. Amelia said with a concerned expression. Um, what are you talking about? We looked at each other and realized for the first time that Ronald had been lying outrageously. It turned out Ronald had been getting financial help from Walt and Amelia, claiming that my overspending was straining our budget. Feeling emboldened, he'd approached them for money several times. If it's hard for you to say, I can talk to Bella about it. Amelia had offered, but Ronald had flatly refused. Naturally. His story was pure fabrication. Even Walt and Amelia had grown suspicious of Ronald, who kept asking for money while I was hospitalized. Then, he apparently pleaded for help again, claiming my hospital bills were astronomical. Upon hearing this, I instantly knew where the money was going. I said to Walt and Amelia, Once you step into our home, you'll quickly see what Ronald spent the money on. I handed them the house key. As expected, Walt and Amelia came back to the hospital room with astonished looks on their face. What's up with that room? How much did it cost to change it like that? I didn't hold back when I told them that Ronald had acted on his own without consulting me. I explained about the terrible treatment I received during my temporary discharge from the hospital and said I had no intention of continuing our married life and was planning to divorce him. The most frustrating part was that he threw away the dresser my mom had bought for me. I'm not coming back. Amelia grabbed my hand, her eyes filled with tears. The dresser? 
He threw away that dresser from mom? Ronald will pay for this. Amelia became very emotional. In fact, Amelia and I had an awkward start, but during a visit to her family home, I had admired a beautiful chest. It's lovely. I commented. Amelia beamed. Actually, this chest was passed down from my grandmother to mom and from mom to me. When I told her about my cherished dresser, she responded. That's so wonderful, keep it close. I don't have a daughter, so if you want, this chest is yours. I was really happy when she told me that. I have no intention of continuing as a couple with Ronald. Think about it, if the roles were reversed, I'd want to slap you right now. Ronald, now yelling, responded. Divorce is extreme. You should be grateful. I made that room stylish. I have to live in a room that's not even to my taste. I shot back. It's way too dark. Do you realize how depressing that is? Also, didn't you plan to use our joint savings for it, but couldn't because it's in my name, so you had to borrow from your parents? It seemed that I was right. Ronald's face turned bright red and he was speechless. We had a dual income arrangement. Living expenses went into an account in Ronald's name, while savings went into an account in my name. The primary purpose of those savings was for when we had a child. It seemed like when I got cancer, Ronald thought, we can't have kids anyway, might as well use that money for whatever I want. I was heartbroken by the situation. Can't you see how much I've cherished Bella? How can you even talk about divorce? This is unfair. I looked at my sobbing husband with cold eyes. That's when Amelia, who was sitting next to me, chimed in. Someone who really cares wouldn't say such awful things. It's no big deal if the house gets dusty when no one's there. Walt and I were right there when you made that ridiculous call to the hospital. We were so disappointed we could cry. Walt's face was flushed red, staring down my husband. It was a relief to have reasonable people on my side. I've finished my treatments, but that doesn't mean I won't relapse. Ronald, you don't even seem to care about my well-being let alone my hair loss and frail body. All you care about is saving your own skin. That's why this isn't working. I've supported you, Ronald, but who's going to support me? My husband lowered his gaze and said nothing more. After that, we finalized our divorce. Thanks to Walt and Amelia's intervention, Ronald wasn't pleased but the division of assets went largely in my favor. Reluctantly, Ronald repaid the money he had borrowed from Walt and Amelia. I was shocked to learn it was a whopping $10,000. Turns out, Ronald couldn't afford to keep the apartment we'd been so particular about, and he had to move out. The floors were scratched from dragging furniture, and there were even holes in the walls. Even worse, it turned out he had replaced the wallpaper without permission. He insisted these damages were there when we moved in, but backed down when the management company produced move-in photos. By the way, I was the one who provided those photos. So, it looks like Ronald incurred some repair costs when he moved out. It wasn't a huge sum, but he couldn't even pay that. He asked Walt and Amelia for help but they disowned him and kicked him out, Amelia later told me. He's in a cheap apartment now, struggling with debt. I still think he should have just made do with what he had, instead of living beyond his means. I heard from a friend, who works at the same company as my ex-husband, that he's now viewed as the creep who tormented his sick wife, especially among the female staff. He brought it upon himself. He'll regret this for the rest of his life. As for me, I'm savoring living alone again after years, all while keeping a close eye on my health. I plan to return to work once I feel more stable physically. My boss has been understanding, 
telling me to take it at my own pace. I'm so grateful. I still catch up with Walt and Amelia from time to time. It's really great, you know, that mom's dresser came back to you. Amelia says during one of our phone chats. I nodded in agreement. When I moved, I took some stuff I didn't need anymore to a thrift shop. While the items were being appraised, I froze. Wait a minute. There it was, my dresser that mom had given me. Whether someone found it in the dump and brought it in didn't matter to me. It may not be a pricey piece, but there's no dresser that could replace it for me. A few days later, the dresser, now cleaned up a bit, arrived at my new place. Etched in small letters on the back corner of the dresser were the words, Bella, never give up, penned by my late mother. Life has its ups and downs, but remembering mom's words has kept me pushing through. And that's not going to change. I'm all set to live my new life with strength and joy, without backing down. By the way, today's your birthday, isn't it? Already 56, huh? Still not giving up on marriage even at this age? How about you, saying such things? Looking back, I'm really glad I was abandoned then. If I had stayed with a man like that, I would never have achieved the happiness I have now. I am Stacia, 56 years old. This was 27 years ago. It was the story of my ninth year at the company I joined after graduating from university. My job was as a receptionist at the company, handling visitors. Nice to meet you, I'm Willard Gibbons. I look forward to working with you. I'm Stacia Rawl at reception. The pleasure is mine. The man introduced as the successor to our client, Willard Gibbons, was the very person who abandoned me. He appeared to be about my age or a bit older. I'd like to say it was Willard's handsome face, but it was actually his voice that captivated me. Just hearing it made me fall for him. With that deep voice, I like you, Stacia. Asterisk whispered in my ear. But surely, he must have a lovely wife and adorable kids. I indulged in such wishful thinking about Willard until, two years later, our relationship changed. It was my last day as a receptionist, as I was moving to another department. That day, Willard, who happened to visit the office, was told by me. Actually, today is my last day at the reception as I'm moving to another department. To which he responded, Oh. Really. Willard, whose expression seemed to darken for a moment, suddenly took out a business card, started writing something on it. Please call me if you feel like it. And handed it to me. On the back of the card was Willard's home phone number. What, really? My heart raced at what could be construed as an advance from Willard, whom I had always thought was married. When I nervously called Willard, he told me he'd had feelings for me since our first meeting. Stacia, such a fitting name for your charming persona. It might be rude to ask a woman her age, but how old are you, Stacia? Taken aback by Willard's sudden familiarity, I hesitantly replied. I'm 31. What? 31? You're five years older than me? I'm sorry. I assumed you were younger, hence my casual tone. No, it's fine. I was just as surprised to know his age. I had thought Willard was about my age or slightly older, not five years younger. Um, would you like to go out for a meal with me sometime? Of course, my answer was a yes, especially when asked in his charming voice. We enjoyed a meal at Willard's favorite restaurant over the weekend. Then, on our way back. We were caught in a sudden downpour, getting completely soaked. My house is nearby. You're welcome to come over to dry off your clothes and hair. He said. Oh, but... After a moment of silence, Willard spoke first. Stacia, would you consider dating me? What? But I'm five years older than you. It's fine. 
I was surprised at first, but you look young, and it's really okay. I appreciate the sentiment, but I only date with marriage in mind. So, I'm serious too. Please consider dating me, with marriage as our goal. It was dark, and I couldn't see his expression clearly, but he didn't seem to be joking. As I hesitated, Willard passionately spoke about marriage and finally said, but, as a man and a professional, I'm not yet in a position to financially support you and a child. So, I ask for a little patience before we marry. Moved by Willard's sincerity and passion, I accepted his feelings. Two years passed without a proposal from Willard, but our relationship was going smoothly. Then, suddenly, tragedy struck. I was diagnosed with a women-specific illness. I've always had severe menstrual cramps, but this time, I felt a dull pain in my lower back when it wasn't even my period, prompting a visit to the doctor. I'll write a referral for you to a specialist right away. I couldn't stop crying in the doctor's office when I heard this. After undergoing thorough examinations at the specialist, I decided to have surgery and finally told Willard about my illness. I was worried when you said you had something serious to talk about. Glad to hear it's not life-threatening. But, Willard, you said you wanted children, remember? Of course, I'd be lying if I said I didn't. But they only said there's a high risk of infertility, not that you can't get pregnant. So, stop looking so apologetic. Okay? Okay. After successfully undergoing surgery and being discharged, I made sure to live a healthy life, from diet to exercise, while attending regular hospital checkups. I started noticing a change in Willard's behavior after I was discharged. Whereas before, we almost always spent weekends together. It's important to have time with the guys, too. He began going out alone more often. I wondered, could there be another woman? An affair? I doubted Willard at times, but... Nothing beats Stacia's cooking. If I'm going to have a wife, she needs to be a great cook like you. He always enjoyed my cooking, and when we were together, Willard was the same as he ever was, so I chose to believe in him. Or rather, I kept telling myself, I have to believe in Willard, I must trust him. Then, one month before my 35th birthday, a day that would become fateful. The happiest event of my life happened. I was pregnant with Willard's child. I wondered how happy Willard would be to learn that I, who might have been unable to conceive, was pregnant. But, considering the risk of miscarriage, I couldn't tell him right away. Then came my 35th birthday. Willard had booked a private room at the fanciest restaurant we'd ever been to. I took my seat nervously and when Willard asked if red wine was okay, I chose water instead. What's wrong, Stacia? You feeling okay? No, it's nothing like that. All right, but... You said you had something to talk about, what is it? You said you had something to say too, Willard. You go first. After a brief back and forth of insisting the other go first. Okay, I'll start then. What came out of Willard's mouth was not what I had expected. What? You want to break up? What do you mean? I'm getting married. My girlfriend is pregnant. Wait a minute. Married? What do you mean your girlfriend is pregnant? It's exactly what it sounds like. Married? Girlfriend? What was all this about? I was in a state of panic, unable to comprehend what Willard was saying. So, what about me waiting for marriage as you asked? I'm pregnant too. Right now, your baby is inside me. What? A baby. That can't be true. Why would I lie about something like this? But Stacia, you said you had infertility issues. Were you deceiving me from the start? 
making me think you couldn't have children just to create a fait accompli. How could you say that? I would never do such a thing. If you had someone else, you should have told me earlier. If only you had told me sooner. Maybe you never intended to marry me from the start. That's not true. It's not like I started disliking you. You're a great cook and pretty. But in the end, you're in your 30s, older. I thought it'd be better to marry and have children with someone younger. Anyway, if my girlfriend or her parents found out about this. What a thing to say. That's just awful. Before I could stop myself, my hand moved and I threw water in Willard's face. Hey! What are you doing? Be thankful it wasn't the red wine. What the hell? I'm soaking wet. I was planning to celebrate your last birthday grandly. Enjoy your life with your young girlfriend. I stood up and left the restaurant. A few days later, Willard came to my apartment. I don't want any trouble later. This is for the hospital bills and a token of gratitude for everything. Please, take it without hesitation. He handed me an envelope filled with cash. I don't need your money. I wanted to throw the envelope back at him. But I needed money to raise my child alone. Fine, I'll take it. As I took the envelope, so you're taking the money after all. Well, it's fine. Let's call it even, no hard feelings. I hope you find someone nice and be happy, Stacia. With those words, Willard left the apartment. I promised my unborn child. I will protect you, mom will keep you safe. 21 years later. The man I never wanted to see again, ironically, I met on my 56th birthday. Heading somewhere that day, I was waiting for the elevator on the ground floor of a certain building. Then, after I got into the elevator, a man wearing glasses followed in from behind. Which floor, please? He replied. Fifth floor, thank you. His voice, deep and to my liking. Hmm? Sounded familiar. But without turning around, I also got off at the fifth floor following the man. He stopped in front of a marriage consultation office. Noticing me standing behind him as he hesitated to enter, the man turned around. Hmm? After a few seconds of mutual puzzlement, Ah! Uh. We exclaimed in unison. Why are you here? Same question to you, what are you doing here? Yes, the man was Willard Gibbons, the one who abandoned me when I was 35. Once slim and muscular, his body now had a belly overhanging his belt, reminiscent of Winnie the Pooh. Willard, now wearing glasses, had changed so much that I might not have recognized him just by passing by. I, too, had changed. Time spares no one, it seems. And once again, I realized the formidable power of 21 years. As I was thinking this, Willard suddenly pointed at me and burst into laughter. By the way, today's your birthday, right? 56 already, huh? Still haven't given up on marriage at your age? You still remember my birthday? If I'm old at 56, then at 51, you're old too, aren't you? What are you talking about? I'm only 51. You round up and you're practically 60. More importantly, why are you here? Aren't you supposed to be married? Did you get divorced? Yeah, yeah. She couldn't cook or even do laundry, washed vegetables with dish soap. I married her because she was young and cute, but not being able to do household chores is unacceptable. So, I decided to cut my losses. What about the child? Wasn't she pregnant? Child? She miscarried soon after. Looking back, I should have taken the child from you at that time. What? After all this time? 
Even if I had given birth then, I would never have handed my child over to you. By the way, Willard, do you have a reservation? This place is by appointment only. What? Reservation? I just passed by and saw the sign, thought I'd drop in to kill time. No need for a reservation, right? Was it age? Or something else with Willard himself? He had become surprisingly rude. I didn't want to spend another minute with such a man. I thought about how to get rid of him. But then it struck me. Could this be an opportunity? Yes. It must be. A chance given by fate to settle a 21-year-old grudge. I abandoned the idea of driving him away and smiled at Willard. I'm going to the restroom. Please go ahead inside. Pretending to go to the bathroom, I sent a message on WhatsApp to someone. Then, entering the consultation office, I listened to the voices in the private rooms. Well, I'm not in a hurry to get married, but, you know, just killing time. Mr. Gibbons, our clients are all serious about marriage. If you're just here to joke around, please leave. I'm sorry. I'm not joking. I'm serious about finding a wife. Please help me. Where did his earlier bravado go? Maybe he was nervous in front of a young woman. Hearing the now apologetic voice of Willard, I almost burst out laughing. In that case, Mr. Gibbons, could you tell us your indispensable criteria for a marriage partner? Well, I'd like someone in her early 20s, petite, good at cooking, and healthy enough to have children. And she should be sociable and intelligent, quick thinking, that's my ideal. Excuse me? The husband works outside, the wife takes care of the home, including housework, childcare, and social interactions. She needs to be sociable. Also, I'm the eldest son, so I'd prefer someone willing to live with my parents. Hmm. Don't worry. My parents are kind and gentle like me. They won't be a nuisance. Eventually, she might need to take care of them, so having a caregiver's qualification would be a plus. Hearing Willard list his ideal conditions, I was astonished. Mr. Gibbons, frankly speaking, the number of women we can introduce to you is close to zero. Suddenly, Willard's polite tone turned into a sharp one. What? Zero? I get it for a 56-year-old, but I'm only 51. Are you saying you can't introduce anyone to me? Mr. Gibbons, who is this 56-year-old you mentioned? Are you referring to my mom? Your mom? Yes, I am that mom. I opened the door and stepped in. You! Surprised, Willard was lost for words. It's easy to say anything when no one's listening. You're too ambitious for an old man. Such an ignorant fool. I am Stacia Cocker, the head of this marriage agency. And this staff member is my daughter, Mavis. Eh? Indeed, the person I messaged while pretending to go to the bathroom was Mavis. I apologize for the late introduction. I'm Mavis, her daughter. Mr. Gibbons, I heard you were a great help to my mom in the past. Allow me to thank you belatedly. No, no, it wasn't like that. Wait, you two are mother and daughter, does that mean, is that child mine? My daughter? Of course not. She's 25. If I had a child back then, they would be around 20 now. Eh? She is Floyd's daughter, whom I married when I was 38. She's my precious daughter now. I married Floyd, who had lost his wife to illness and was raising his daughter alone, through a marriage agency. And now, I want to help people who are raising children alone for various reasons, just like my husband and I did, to find their own encounters. I want to make the concept of meeting someone feel more accessible and closer to the heart. Inspired by that thought, 
I opened a marriage consultation agency when I was 42 years old. Thanks to being abandoned by you 21 years ago, I found a happy family and a fulfilling job. Thank you very much. What? I never wanted to see you again, but being able to thank you like this clears my heart. But please, never show yourself to me again. What? Never show my face again? I don't want to see yours ever again either. Mavis then spoke to Willard, who was glaring at me. Then, Mr. Gibbons, it seems we weren't meant to work together. Could you please leave now? I would have left even if you hadn't said that. We wish you luck and hope you find a suitable match. The exit is that way, please take care. As Mavis politely guided him. Mocking me, mother and daughter together. Frustrated, Willard threw his paper coffee cup against the wall. However, the paper cup was empty, having been drained of its contents. It fell to the floor, making a faint, pitiless sound. He then lifted the chair he was sitting on. I immediately instructed Mavis. Mavis, call the police. No, call Floyd directly. There's a man causing a scene. Right, Dad will come quickly. As Mavis was about to call. Wait. Your husband is a cop. Fine, I won't do anything. I'm leaving, just don't call. Rushing to leave, Willard headed in the wrong direction. That's the bathroom. The exit is over there, as Mavis just said. It's a confusing layout. It's all a nuisance. He kicked a nearby potted plant and limped out of the room. Take care. Mavis and I waved him off with smiles. Mom, it was really a good thing you broke up with him. And he even thought dad was a cop. Really? He's so clueless. My husband Floyd isn't a police officer but owns a security company. An avid rugby player since high school, Floyd could easily handle Willard. Let's go home early for your birthday celebration tonight. Yes, let's. As for Willard Gibbons, who fled our marriage agency. After that, he seemed to have gone to another marriage consultation agency, but was quickly expelled for causing trouble, and the same thing happened at the next agency he visited. Eventually, Willard was labeled a dangerous person by the marriage agency industry in the area and was banned from entering. He caused a major scene at one of the agencies that rejected him. I heard from a colleague that he was detained and taken away by the police who responded to a call about his behavior. Meanwhile, I celebrated my 56th birthday with my family. Really, both Brannon and Dad, a father and son who both hate tomatoes. Sis, can't help it. I take after Dad. Come to think of it, you've recently started to look more like Dad, haven't you? Now you too, Mom. It's normal for a family to resemble each other, right? That's true. This Brannon, who Mavis and I were teasing, is the child who was in my womb 21 years ago. I told Brannon about his biological father when he turned 20. I am who I am today because of that man, but I don't want to meet or even think about the guy who abandoned mom and me. My dad is my only dad, and my family is dad, mom, and sis. Brannon said this to me. If Willard ends up leading a bachelor's life forever, that would be his own fault. It's none of my concern. However, for Brannon, he is a blood-related father. That's an undeniable fact. For Brannon's sake, I hope Willard can lead a decent life. Brannon and I have plans, so we'll be heading out first. Huh? I don't have any plans, though. You really are clueless. Come on, let's go. Uh, okay. You two enjoy the rest of your time. Thanks to Mavis and Brannon's consideration, I walked along the coast, shoulder to shoulder with my husband, Floyd. The sea breeze felt pleasant on my cheeks. Stacia, thank you for being with me. 
and please continue to be with me. Likewise, thank you. We naturally held hands as we walked.